Heavenly Father, thank you for our time tonight. Thank you that we're able to um, go deeply into uh, the doctrine of the Son of God. It's amazing. You're amazing. And uh, we just dedicate this time to you. Help us to learn the right truths um, about our Lord and Savior Jesus, about the second member of the Trinity, about how the Trinity works. All these things are difficult and deep at times, but important for us to study so that we get things right and our faith grows. So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, it's uh, always good to <clears throat> be in the worship in the round pulpit, so it's uh, my turn tonight. And so we've been going through the biblical doctrine book, which is big and heavy. This is the uh, John MacArthur, uh, Dick Mayhew book, um, Biblical Doctrine, a Systematic Summary of Bible Truth, and uh, there is a lot here. And so uh, my task tonight was to focus on chapter 4, which is Christology, with the doctrine of God the Son. So uh, in, in my latter years in the military, uh, you know, when I had, had achieved some, I guess, tenure and rank, I got to do some retirement ceremonies. And uh, I always found doing a retirement ceremony really tough because how do you sum up a 20-plus year career in the military in, you know, a 10-minute pithy speech? It's impossible. I'm not going to sum up Christology in, you know, 35 or 40 minutes tonight um, by any stretch of the imagination. I'm... I'm um, uh, intimidated a bit to, to do what I'm going to talk about um, because the chapter in our textbook is really just uh, an expansive attempt to talk holistically about Jesus. And there's so much there. It's a deep dive into Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is fully God and fully man. That's a whole deep discussion in and of itself, uh, the hypostatic union. And uh, Jesus' blood sacrifice on the cross at Calvary is the salvation for all who believe. And because this is so, he is the central character of all inspired scripture. He is the whole point of the Bible. Everything points to Jesus from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation. And so the fact that he is the main point of the Holy Bible, which we know is inspired and inerrant and infallible and authoritative and sufficient for life and doctrine should push us to want to know more about Jesus. And so um, there's a lot here. It's profound. Um, so what I, what I hope to do tonight is not give you, you know, the whole chapter. What I hope to do tonight is inspire you to dig deep and, and go, go on your own. Go buy one of these books and, and read deeply into it. I mean, that's how we really, really go after is when we pursue Jesus. So with that goal in mind, let me just uh, begin by quoting the introduction to chapter 4 out of the book, because I think it sets the right tone. The biblical witness concerning Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is woven like a scarlet thread through the entirety of the written Word of God. As the second person of the Godhead, the Savior's person and work constitute the central testimony of all Scripture as it is written. In Revelation 19.10, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Really, two exhortations come out of this quote. First, as Christians, we should greatly desire to know Jesus more all the time, right? It's, uh, you know, relationships are never static. You know, you're either moving towards somebody or, or away from somebody. And so we need to be pursuing Jesus and uh, we, we should want to understand, make sure our understanding about him is correct. Second, we have to affirm that our understanding can only go so far as God's word gives us. Holy Scripture, our Holy Bible, does explain Jesus. The Holy Spirit does illuminate the study of the Scriptures, which is a promise of reward for our spiritual discipline and diligence when we do pursue God. Um, the Holy Spirit uh, promises to help us understand him better. But we have to be very careful neither to add nor take away anything from what the Bible tells us, okay? So more bluntly, there aren't any shortcuts to this. There's no experiential or emotion-driven options to understanding Jesus better, nor can we ever make things up or believe ideas or stories not 100% explicit and verifiable in God's Word. It's an admonition. We have to study Jesus using Holy Scripture, which is inspired. So... The outline of the, uh, what I call the big white book really explains Christology in three categories. 
pre-incarnate Christ, which is addressing the second person in the, into eternity past, incarnate Christ, which is the record of Jesus, as he walked among men upon the creation that, that he, he brought into existence. He breathed the earth, the earth literally into existence, but he came and served in full humanity. And then finally, the glorified Christ, who uh, is King Jesus beyond the cross, King Jesus beyond the cross, beyond the glorious resurrection that we know is written and described in the uh, Gospels, and this is the King Jesus who will come again in glory and rightly rule into eternity future. And so as I was wading through the research on this, I saw that uh, much of the teaching in the church is rightly focusing on uh, Christ incarnate, his birth, his life, his ministry, his sacrificial death, his finished work. It's all depicted in the Gospels. We're going through the Gospel of Matthew with Jeff, uh, and we'll continue with that when he gets back. Um, there's also a pretty good emphasis on uh, the glorified Christ because I think uh, people long for heaven. They long for uh, being in glory with Jesus. And so, um, and I think as times get really stressful, people want to read Revelation and understand it because they think the end times are coming. So, um, it's probably safe to say that uh, uh, most of us maybe don't understand the pre-incarnate Christ as well as the other two categories. I know that was my case. So that's where I want to focus tonight. You know, what do you know about Jesus before his virgin birth, before he condescended into this world and was born of a virgin and uh, came into this life with flesh and lived as fully man and, and fully God? Well, um, there's uh, two things, two giant things that pop out as we look at the pre-incarnate Christ that I want to offer tonight. The first is that he has always, always existed as the son, God the Son. His sonship is fixed and eternal. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Second, in his pre-incarnate eternal sonship, he was busy. He was active. He was doing a lot of things. Uh, mostly uh, advancing the overarching grace plan designed to save humankind. And so these activities are recorded for us in Scripture. Um, he appeared to men to interact with them in key strategic moments, and these, things are, these interactions are called theophanies, and we'll talk more about that. And he accomplished work in the forms of creation, providence, and revelation, and even judgment. And so my goal is to develop these two points about the pre-incarnate Christ that his sonship was fixed and eternal, and that there is an awesome record of his vital activities in uh, saving us before his incarnation. So he uh, worked before coming to this world. He worked in this world, crucified, dead, buried, resurrected, um, and then he's coming again in glory. So we're going to unpack all of this. Let's start with a, a, a simple definition. Pre-incarnate is a term used to explain Christ before the time of his incarnation. Makes sense, right? It's a term used to describe uh, incarnation is when he voluntarily assumed humanity. And again, that's his birth, his life, his ministry, and his death on the cross. Um, but Scripture, of course, speaks of both the deity and the humanity of Christ. We have to always look at that. The person of Christ is always fully divine. As much as we get emphasis on his humanity in the Gospels, we have to always remember he's fully de divine, and eternally so. So as we look back into eternity past, we'll learn about the pre-incarnate Christ and come, we come right away to two concepts that we should try to get our hands around to try to, to, try to understand. It's triunity, triunity and pre-existence, okay? This is heavy, I told you. So <laughs> bear with me, we're gonna dig deep. Regarding triunity, we have to see that uh, the Jesus who is always, uh, that we have to see that Jesus has always existed within the Trinity. So um, throughout the Old and New Testaments, the writers make reference to the distinctions between uh, the persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They all appear as distinct persons with individual operations and, and roles, if you will. John 1, 1 is perhaps the clearest example pointing to the Son as a distinct, separate entity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the and, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. And so we have to see it this way. We have to try to understand the Trinity. It's a mystery. A unified God 
ever existing, always, but three persons with three different roles that go on in perfect unity and perfect communication all the time. That's, that's where we have to go with the Trinity. And it's easy to think of God the Father in the Old Testament as that's all, you know, that's all that sort of was. That's where Islam goes with Allah. One God and that's it. And, you know, so, but uh, Scripture tells us differently. And so this idea that uh, you have the Trinity working in all of eternity, we, we have to embrace that. Building on the foundation of separate identity, Scripture describes this incredible love relationship between the persons of the Godhead. It also describes ongoing communications between the three, and uh, Scripture communicates always a unified purpose under a single Godhead. So what you have is perfection, perfection all the time, perfect love, perfect unity, perfect connection, perfect communication, perfect understanding, perfect execution of the roles they're responsible for. And one of the main focus of the Trinity is saving us. Let that sink in for a minute. Saving us. Wow. So within these roles, you know, we should, we should be thinking about that, and, and this points us back to God the Son. God the Son's vital role in our salvation, this is breathtaking, and it's evident in the scriptural depictions of Jesus. There are names of Jesus, and lots of them, and uh, I'll just tick off a few here. Um, advocate, bread of life, beloved son, bridegroom, chief cornerstone, deliverer, good shepherd, great high priest, head of the church, Emmanuel, king of kings, lamb of God, Lord of all, mediator, Messiah, mighty one, redeemer, risen Lord, rock, savior, son of man, the door, the way, the truth, the life, the word, true vine. There's more. There's more. This is our Jesus. So the Trinity is a mystery but there's enough clarity in Scripture for us to comprehend both the Trinity and Jesus' second member role within it at the level that God desires us to understand. God has the right to reserve some mysteries, right? He can keep some things to himself, and we shouldn't be offended by that, all right? So we have all of eternity to learn everything about God, and maybe uh, who knows how that's going to go. But all of eternity, learning about the God, the great God of the universe, that's an amazing promise. But God gives us enough to understand. So in sum, the Trinity means the three persons of the Godhead in perfect relationship, in perfect awareness, in perfect purpose, in perfect harmony, in perfect unity, and in perfect love, perfectly all the time. It's perfect. Praise God. I want God to be perfect, don't you? All right. So the next concept to understand looking back is this from the virgin birth into eternity passes, pre-existence, pre-existence. What is pre-existence? What kind of existence did Christ have prior to his incarnation? In other words, what was the state of his, his existence or his pre-existence in his deity alone before he took on humanity? Well, the second person of the Trinity resided in heaven and came to earth from heaven at the moment of his miraculous conception um, of his human nature in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And Matthew chapter 1 tells us that, and then the Gospel of Luke also tells us that in Luke 1, 26 to 38. Jesus was sent by the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, as a result of God's love for mankind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that he, whoever believes in him, should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. John 3, 16 and 17. Very familiar verse to us. The son came down from heaven. John 3, 31. When the father sent him, more out of John, John 6, and, the, and then out of 1 John 4, 9. The arrival of the son on earth at the incarnation demonstrates that his prior existence was in heaven. Okay, so second person of the Godhead existed before the creation of the universe in heaven. Indeed, the Bible identifies Jesus as the creator. That's important. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1.3, 1 Corinthians 8.6, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1.2. And verse 10, we have to 
I guess when I was a young Christian, that didn't really sink in for me too much. I didn't see Jesus as literally the one breathing creation into existence. But as I started to study in seminary and I started to take Bible classes and I started to really go through the rigor of the Master's Seminary, it dawned on me, you know, Yahweh in the Old Testament is Christ. It's the Trinity, but it's Christ. And we'll talk more about that here in just a second. We never want to make Jesus less than he is. We want to make Jesus all that he is. That's the whole point of Christology. So logically, the creator of all things must exist prior to his active creation, before the existence of all created things. Thus, the scriptures testify to the fact that he possessed divine glory before the world existed, before the world existed. We can only try to wrap our finite brains around what something could be before material universe was breathed into existence. So these are mysteries, but it should inspire us and it should make us wonder about how big and amazing God really is. When we want to make him small, we should try to remember this. The second person of the Godhead is eternal in his nature and existence and is fully co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. We have to be careful to think that the beginning relates merely to the commencement of creation. In in the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews, this is probably Paul, he clearly contrasts the temporary finite existence of the creation with the permanent eternal existence of the creator, the Son of God himself. Listen to this. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. Hebrew, Hebrews 1, 10 to 12. And then Psalm 102 reflects that same same sentiment. This is amazing. You know, when we're tempted to believe that God can't help us through our little tiny struggles that we're having, we... We have to think about him in pre-existence. I, I don't know. That helps me. It helps me when I try to make God small to go back and realize how big he really is. The Old Testament describes Christ's existence as from old, from ancient days. Isaiah describes the titles Mighty God and Everlasting Father to him and it indicates that the incarnation of God, of the God-man existed, not only the birth of a child but also the giving of a son. Christ has always existed as the Son of God, but became a child only at the moment of his miraculous conception, which was voluntary and and an amazing um, thought about his willingness to condescend to come to earth as fully human. If all this makes sense to you, um, it it should whet your appetite for more. I hope it does. The eternal existence of the second person raises a question, though. And that question is, in regards to the relationship Christ had within the Godhead as the second person of the Trinity, or the Word, as John 1-1 speaks of him. Did he always exist in eternity past as the Son? As the Son. Was the relationship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, was that eternity past, or was that something that that changed at his incarnation? Right? This is, It's an important question, and... Uh, um, because a wrong, a wrong understanding will, will start you down a slippery slope path of a lesser Jesus, all right? So that's why we have to be careful. And uh, false religions out there have done this, um, and the Mormon church is one in particular. Uh, so two major views have arisen around this question, eternal sonship and incar- incarnational sonship. So Hebrews 1.5 at first glance appears to speak of the Father's begetting the Son as an event that takes place at a point in time. You are my Son, today I have begotten you, and I will be to him a Father, and he shall be to me my Son. You know, that sounds sounds like, um, you know, there's there's some new relationship developing there, right? Uh, Begetting normally speaks of a person's origin. Um, Sons are generally subordinate to their fathers. Therefore, it's appearing to say that, you know, at that point in time in history, that 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 was was a a new development in the Trinity relationship, right? Um, Well, the father-son relationship, uh, 
we have to see that as one that didn't change and that demands that there's perfect equality and eternality that must exist among the persons of the Trinity. So the incarnational sonship line of reasoning concludes that sonship indicates the place of voluntary submission when Christ condescended and so there was a change. And uh, that's, not, that's not what Scripture tells us and that's not, you know, as you dig deep into the big white book and, and read into all the verses that support the idea of eternal sonship, you'll see, you'll see that that's, that's an erroneous way to look at it. The eternal sonship view rests on the observation that the title Son of God, when applied to Christ in Scripture, seems to always speak about his essential deity and absolute equality with God, not a voluntary separation. So hold on to that. The Jewish leaders at the time of Jesus' uh, you know, uh, walk on this earth, they understood this. And John 5.18 says that they, they sought the death penalty for Jesus because they charged him with blasphemy. Um, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. In that culture at that time, a dignitary's adult son was deemed equal in statute, stature and privilege with the father. That's how you have to think of it, okay? The same deference demanded by a king was afforded to the adult son. The son was, after all, of the very same essence as his father, heir to all the father's rights and privileges, and therefore equal in every significant regard. So when Jesus was called the son of God, it was an understanding categorically by all as a title of deity, as a title of deity, making him equal with God. That's why the Jewish leaders were so upset. And uh, that means that they thought of him, he was arguing that he was of the same essence as, as the father, okay? And that's why they got so upset and they wanted to kill him. So if Jesus' sonship signifies his, signifies his deity and absolute equality with the father, it cannot be a title that pertains only to his incarnation. Really important we see that, right? What, what, what we all want at the end of the day is a God that doesn't change, Right? That, that's really what this argument is about. And it also puts, you know, the, uh, the salvation of, of humankind, you know, may, maybe at, at, a, at a higher level of importance than perhaps we should boldly say, all right? We, we don't know all the, thing, all the things that God does, but we do know that we're made in his image, and so we're really important in that respect, and we do know that he made us to, to share in fellowship with him and to worship him and to share in giving him glory, and when we give him glory, we are incredibly blessed by that. So it's, we're important, okay? But we don't, we, there's a lot that we don't know. But we, we don't want to um, chase doctrines that give us a changing God. And so uh, the book goes into a really dense and detailed defense of eternal sonship, and so I would point you there if you want to keep digging more. But we have to understand that... Um, Christ in his deity is, is not a created being in any sense. He had no beginning, but is as timeless as God himself. So the beginning part is really um, a way that uh, we try to explain using human language, human understanding, human terms. It's uh, anthropomological. <laughs> now, that's easy to spit out. It's when we put human, um, human attributes, you know, into understanding of God, all right? And so what we have to... We have to really look at this as, as a way of, of we know enough to know that um, we, we serve a really big God and uh, the Trinity is a mystery, but we know enough about it to, to be excited by it and uh, we have an unchanging God that's always existed and that's interested in saving us, all right? Hopefully that helps. So um, we're going to keep rolling here. So... Um, Let's talk about, um, you know, what Jesus did in his pre-incarnation. So he was eternally God the Son. There's a period before his physical birth on this earth, and he did work. He did work. So what we have is first to look at Old Testament appearances, Old Testament appearances. I didn't really understand this all that well until, you know, pretty recently, to be honest. Um, but it's really cool to think about it. And so the idea of God appearing to men in the Old Testament is called a theophany. 
And there are many of them in the Old Testament. And we start to look at them, um, and the book gives a whole list of them. Uh, we see how many there are. Um, and I, I uh, preached a sermon, I think last March, on Isaiah 6, where it's, you know, the prophet Isaiah getting his commission, you know, from God himself in the, in the, temp, in the temple in, in Jerusalem, and the, in the theophany that he sees is actually a Christophany, which is a vision of Christ, right? And so these appearances, um, give you a quick definition, a guy by the name of James, James Borland said, these appearances seem to possess one significant feature. All of them reveal at least in a partial manner something about God himself or his will to the recipient. So the question becomes, should we identify the divine person in such appearances as the pre-incarnate Son of God, which is rightly labeled a Christophany. Well, Borland goes on to give a working definition of a Christophany, and it's this. Those unsought, intermittent, and temporary, visible, and audible manifestations of, manifestations of God, the Son, in human form, by which God communicated something to certain conscious human beings on earth prior to his, the birth of Jesus Christ. So the question is, are all theophanies Christophanies? Or all theophanies Christophanies? Well, I'm not ready to go to that length and defend that position. There are some that would, that would do that. But what I will say is that most theophanies are Christophanies. Most are. And that's defensible. The angel of the Lord visitations that point to Christ as messenger... Um, because as, as you know, that, that the angel was actually a, a Christophany, uh, because when the biblical account associates the angel of the Lord with a theophany, um, the idea that the, um, the messenger is probably a better translation than angel, because this is a, uh, um, a title that denotes function of the office or, or of the individual, not his nature. So, um, as we look deeper into these and, and we start to study what, what people have written dissertations on, um, we, we start to see that uh, whenever there is um, a moment where somebody bears the name Lord uh, or is considered um, di displaying divine attributes and authority or receiving worship, you can bet it's a Christophany. Does that make sense to you? All right. Matthew 2.2, 2, Matthew 11. 14, 33, 28, 9, and, and 17 will we'll help there if you want to go dig them out. And again, what I want to do is just whet your appetite. Um, there's much, much more in the book. So finally, given what John 1.18 says about the Son, that no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. The appearances of God in the Old Testament have li are likely the Son, not the Father. The phrase made him known is from the, the Greek... Um, exegeomai, which is a word from which we derive the word exegete. So literally, um, Theophanes, Christophanes, the Old Testament, was the Son of God exegeting the Father to mankind is one way to think about that. That's kind of a deep thought. All right, so uh, bottom line is Christ appeared to men for very specific reasons, and uh, most Theophanies in the Old Testament are Christophanies, and it's a great study to go look at that. All right, so what were some of the other activities of, of Christ in the Old Testament, the second person of the Godhead? Well, creation is a huge one, providence, revelation, and judgment. And let me touch on, these, touch on these quickly. All are acts of deity and demonstrate that Jesus is God, and Jesus' works in the Old Testament really parallel what he did in the New Testament and and uh, add significantly to those works. So Jesus, this is the awesome part about the idea of Jesus in creation. Um, this is the work of the second person of the Godhead, and it really comes out in the New Testament. The New Testament tells us that Jesus was the creator. And uh, it's amazing because um, the whole idea of breathing the, the creation into existence makes sense because... You know, we can identify with, with, uh, with Jesus in his humanity, right? And so, um, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So, lots of scripture there to look at that 
really hammer home this point. All three of the persons of the Godhead participated in some way in creation, but the Scripture identifies the Son of God as speaking everything into existence. Do you see that? Do you see that? That's, that's something that's amazing to me, and, and it's just profound because, um, you know, we think, about, we think about Jesus and what we know about the Gospels and, and, and this the heartbreaking story of the Passion, and then we think of Jesus hanging on the cross, we think of Jesus being whipped and beaten and scourged and scorned, and this is the Creator who spoke it all into existence. Think about that. Think about that. Think about what he did for us by his grace while we were still sinners and hated and we were at war with him, right? This is a, an amazing God. This is an amazing Christ. All right, providence. Providence involves the care of God over all his creation. It includes the outworking of all his decrees in order that he might ultimately be glorified in all that he has done. And so in the execution of his programs of the kingdom and redemption and all their details. So the Trinity was acting, acted together to create man in the image of God. And uh, so there's um, providential work going on when mankind rebelled against God after the flood. And again, the Trinity, including the Son, intervened in world history to direct the outcome where he divided you know, mankind and scattered men and gave them different languages and to ensure that the divine program of the world would continue to unfold. So Jesus is actively involved in providential, um, sovereign care over humankind to keep marching the grace plan forward inexorably and unfailingly. Does that make sense? He is a promise keeper. He is the only real promise keeper. And so when God said it would be done in the garden... It's going to be done all the way to the end in Revelation, and that's, that's providence, and the Trinity is very active in that, and the second member of the Trinity is providing his role in that, if that makes sense to you. All right, Revelation is another important term. Um, revelation, uh, the term uh, inspiration identifies the work of God in giving written revelation to mankind, so um, the reason we believe our Bible is inspired is because... Uh, it's self-attesting and says so. Second Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is breathed out, which means inspired by God and profitable. The phrase breathed out by God is but one word in Greek, and that word is an adjective modifying Scripture. In fact, the next adjective, profitable, also modifies Scripture, so it's not, it's, it's, it's modifying, um, you know, the fact that all Scripture is breathed out. It's important to see it that way. So, Scripture, not the writers, possess the quality of being inspired. That's what this verse is telling us. God breathed means the Scripture's inspired, not the writers. Not smart, genius guys who happen to think great thoughts and think about God in ways that other men did and wrote it down and we've captured it. No, this is God speaking. This is God himself speaking. And so, uh, the second member of the Trinity, Christ, is a huge part of that. The point of the word for God breathes is that scriptures owe their origin and context to the divine breath, the Spirit of God. So Paul, by superintending work of the Spirit of God, you know, wrote to Timothy to write this down that inspiration relates directly to inscripturation. So um, the bottom line there is that the second member of the Trinity, very involved in giving us this which we have for life and doctrine, right? So our Lord, our Savior, the Jesus that suffered and died for us, very active in giving us his truth so that it all would come together perfectly for us and so that we can read it now and just be amazed by it and have our minds blown and go, how can I not believe? That's, that's really the idea here. And so the more you dig into this book, the more amazing it is. There's, there's no bottom to it. There's no, there's no way to just say, all right, I've read it all, and there's no more to learn. There's, I, we don't have enough lifetimes to learn it all. That's why we're going to spend eternity learning about God, right? And so Jesus very actively in giving us truth that we have today, and all of it just makes perfect sense. It all comes together so amazingly. 
So Jesus himself conforms, confirms that the Father sent his word by his messenger. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me and has himself given me a commandment, what, do you say, what to say and what to speak. And so these are important realities. And uh, again, I'm just skimming on the wave tops here. Um, and I'm, I've got maybe five more minutes and we'll wrap up. The Son of God appears in both the Old Testament and the New as the one speaking to God's people. Thus, the Bible reveals that the divine spokesman is the Son of God himself, the very one whom the Apostle John describes as the Word in the opening of his gospel. Again, this is so cool. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this is Jesus. Jesus, active, active in Revelation. All right. There's one other critical role that God, that God the Son plays in the salvation plan for mankind, and that is the role of judge, the role of judge. It's sobering. In the final judgment, the Son of God, as the Son of Man, will judge the wicked and the righteous. From Matthew 25, verses 31 and 41. When he comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. John's gospel explains the appointment of God the Son as the judge of all. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. John 5, 22 to 23. Authority to bring judgment rests on the fact that he is the Son of Man, John 5, 27. And think of it this way, who, who better than the one person of the Godhead who is truly human and who has experienced life as a man in a fallen world and remained blameless and without sin? The Son of God came into the world in order to be the Son of Man and to execute judgment, John 9, 39. So with, with all the awesomeness of thinking about the pre-incarnate Christ, and remember we just talked about the pre-incarnate Christ. In the chapter you get the incarnate Christ and then you get the glorified Christ. There's so much there. But as we think about the amazing grace plan and Jesus Christ's role in it and all that he does and how important he is and that he's in perfect communion all the time with the Father and the Holy Spirit, it should sober us as we think about him being judge. We, we just have to consider unfathomable goodness and grace, but at the same time, we have to also think about right and wrong and judgment. And if, if we're not saved by grace, if we don't have saving faith, we are an enemy of God. We are. We're either saved by God or we're lost. Our soul is either right with him or we're warring against him. We're either at peace with him or we're separated from him. We're either counted righteous in his sight, justified by faith, or we're due holy wrath. We're either graced with eternal life and fellowship with him or we're headed for trouble. We're headed for hell, like Satan and the demons. Never-ending punishment, never-ending separation from the God who loves us and created us. I want to be in the royal family, <laughs> and by faith, we all can. And so, let me just close with, you know, have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from your sins? I think so. I hope so. I think all of us here, the few that are back here, <laughs> the small, the remnant, I'm glad. I, you know, we, but we need to be thinking about our salvation. It's serious. And so, um, God the Son is a very, very important topic, and uh, I, you know, we're not all in seminary, but, um, you know, the more you take time to just, you know, challenge yourself and dig a little bit, the more amazed you will be. That's my testimony in all of this.